the audience hope you can wander or you want me to stand wander 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 okay we can do this I'll kind of wander I won't wander it so first of all I want to tell you that this is a crazy screen to stand in front of the, the perspective right here is nuts um, uh, we're going to be talking about making better decisions, and uh, this wasn't coordinated at all, but Katrina's talk this morning actually covered some of the really cool scientific background of some of the things we're going to get into. Uh, my name is Marty Hawk, as you see here. Um, uh, most of you might know me because I help run RubyConf and RailsConf. Awesome. I used to uh, run a conference in Boulder called Rocky Mountain Ruby, I also helped uh, organized Mountain West Ruby Conference back in the day, so it's what, nine years of conference organizing. So I've just now got back into speaking, and this is what we're going to talk about today. So, um, who has read a Choose Your Own Adventure type book? Yeah? Oh, cool. All right, fans, great. So we're going we're gonna to do a little Choose Your Own Adventure story today, and uh, this one is called Hiring Your Next Developer. <laughs> so, your boss um, loved you says you're going to be on the interview team. And you're like, um, OK. So you join your interview team. And uh, they're eclectic, <laughs> but lovable individuals. And um, you're, you're given a stack of resumes. And uh, this is your first time doing this, by the way. But you're cool. You're like, I got this. And um, so you start going through the resumes. And uh, you come across uh, one that stands out. You decide you would like to look at this individual. His name is Steve. And um, he has pretty much what you want to see in uh, a resume. And you decide that his resume is good enough that you choose not to look at the resumes at this point. You just want to go ahead and you choose the first option, which is you're going to interview Steve. So he shows up, and he, he matches pretty much what you expect. He looks like a typical developer. Um, now, his answers are a bit short, but they're correct. You know. Uh, there, are, there are times where the others get talking about like uh, tacos and chunky bacon. And, um, and you do want to delve in a little bit further into some of the questions, but the, the other team, the rest of the team wants to move on. So you go ahead and you seem satisfied with it, so you move on. Now, uh, you go ahead and offer them the choice on the back of the other slide there. And um, so things aren't quite right, though. Uh, turns out um, that uh, he's pretty slow to get onboarded with the, uh, the team. That's not unusual. But after a couple weeks, some of the skills that you expected him to have as a developer are a little bit lacking. And so you've got this situation. Which are you going to choose to do? Well, you choose to, um, to question Steve about his skills. And um, he doesn't take it too well. He uh, reacts a little poorly to it. And actually, it turns out that um, Steve is not really a developer, but a benevolent older god. <laughs> you chose him poorly. <laughs> so let's back up a second. Yep, this is you. You're probably wondering how you got ended up in this situation. And uh, to really explore this, we have to dive into how we make decisions. Now, our brain that has two modes of thinking uh, when it comes to decision making, and uh, Katrina's already touched on some of this, we have the instinctive and we have the rational. The instinctive part of our brains is fast, it's intuitive, it's automatic. And um, an example of when we think this way, if someone, say, threw a ball or some object kept hurtling at you, you would immediately react. Yeah. Depending on your, your experiences, you would either catch it or you'd duck. Uh, this is your instinctive mind at work. Oh, so if Cthulhu showed up and vaporized part of your office, your immediate reaction would be instinctive. You would not stop to think. So you could say the instinctive way of thinking, um, what's really neat about it is it's incredibly powerful, and uh, it is responsible for most of what we do, say, think, and believe. And uh, Katrina already covered a lot of this earlier. So it's a really, really cool part of our uh, brain. And uh, those who become expert or master some skill use this part of their brain heavily. 
Now, rational is what we normally uh, consider when we're making decisions. This is pretty slow, it's logical, it takes effort. It's like uh, I'm calculating things, I'm analyzing a lot of data, I'm reading through stuff, spending a lot of effort. So this is the analytical ability that takes a lot of attention, time, and effort. So there's a lot of cost in this. And uh, there's a, some interesting things about this that I would love to get into, but we don't have time, and we're going to move on to um, the rest of uh, sort of a catch that our brains have, because both of these my, ways of thinking are um, very neat and powerful, but they have cognitive biases that get in the way. Now, cognitive biases, um, these are these preloaded shortcuts that um, we have developed over time, over evolution, that at one point served us very well. They're what allows us to make these split decisions that can um, save our lives or um, protect us from bad things. But unfortunately, a lot of these biases also are responsible for us making terrible decisions. We essentially can be manipulated when um, if people understand how these work, they can use them against you, and you don't even know it. Matter of fact, there are so many of these biases, this cool infographic has over 180 of these things categorized. So this is a very rich, interesting uh, space to get into, uh, but it's important for us to know these because these trigger and affect how we make decisions. We're gonna look at a few of them that played into our hiring kerfuffle played out earlier. So the first thing is confirmation bias. So in our example, when we looked over Steve's resume, it matched a lot of the preconceived notions we had about what uh, developers should look like, what they should know, what they should have been doing. And when we saw these things, we, we had matched up with what we expected, thus we didn't feel the need to look further. We assumed that was correct. So this is confirmation bias. This happens quite a bit, it's a powerful word. It affects you probably daily. The other one that we're going to look at is stereotyping. This is one that we've heard quite a bit, so this is not a new cognitive bias that we've heard about. But this one pairs uh, pretty well with confirmation bias. And uh, again, when, when Steve came in in person, he looked like the developer. We saw things on the resume, and we assumed that they were good enough. We didn't need to dig deeper and verify things. And sometimes this is how our brains work, and we won't even though we should, we won't bother because we see enough to know that it's a good match. The final one is bandwagon effect. You've heard this one as well. And this is the idea that as the others on the interview team were comfortable with how things were going with the answer they were hearing, you could pick up that they were comfortable and you didn't feel as um, comfortable uh, disrupting or uh, you know, rocking the boat by raising any concerns. So uh, it's important that we know these because, well, only you can prevent other chores by avoiding these bad decisions. So the question is, what do we do about these? And thankfully, my cartoon foxes are here to help me um, uh, ask the questions. There are things we can do, and what I would tell you is we can train ourselves through deliberate practice and mindfulness to be aware of these biases. It's the first start. We can also direct our experiences to improve our skills and intuition to make better decisions. Though we've heard uh, previously about instincts and intuition that it does seem pretty magical, we can build them up. It's, it's through our experiences that we are able to shape these. So <clears throat> one of the important pieces to understand here is that experience is really key. And we um, use it as the foundation of our good decisions. But yes, as you had guessed, not any experience uh, matters. You want to make sure that you have the right kind of experiences. So the quality of your experience and what you're uh, working on, what you're working through, makes a huge uh, piece of knowing, uh, developing that expertise. One of the examples of this that I can recall is when I started programming in the 90s, um, I worked on some teams where the developers were pretty much just going through the motions. It was all good enough. They, uh, it was like a, just a normal paycheck and they wouldn't, uh, weren't interested in really improving themselves. They were good enough with the level of work they were doing. 
And it was a bit frustrating because I, uh, I would have liked to have gotten better, but it was you know, surrounded by people that didn't mind or didn't care. And uh, the moment that I joined the Extreme, extreme Programming team, I um, learned so much more in six months than I had learned over five years of doing this more traditional corporate IT experience. And it's actually one of the reasons why I started Hot Codeworks, because I was sick and tired of working at places that didn't really care about our process or how to make software better, and they weren't interested in improving. So I wanted to explore this question of whether or not um, I could make something that worked better as a team and make, make better software. And three years ago, um, because mentoring is a foundation of our culture at my company, the, uh, we started an apprenticeship program. And I've had six apprentices go through uh, in the three years. And a lot of what I'm going to present to you today is based on my experiences, both what I've had them do and the things that I have recognized I would have liked them to do. So we have eight weird tricks, or maybe not all weird, uh, tricks to making better decisions. So trick number one, learn about cognitive biases. We've already touched on this. This is good. There's a lot more you can get into, though. The book Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman is a great place to start, so I recommend you look at that. For, um, for if you're not, don't want to read that book quite yet, there are four that I recommend you look at for now. Although this, this whole subject matter is very fascinating, and um, I've really enjoyed reading more and more about these. But anchoring, availability, heuristic, loss aversion, and sunk cost fallacy are four that really stand out that affect us quite a bit, especially in what, the kind of work that we do. Trick number two, use a deliberate process on high value decisions. Down here, drink of water. That's a good decision. Also, don't put the glass of water on a tilted surface. So what we're talking about here, this is a five step process that you can use for making small and uh, or big decisions. And you can use this on your own or you can use this with a group probably seems a little familiar. So step number one is to find the goal. What are you trying to accomplish? You want to ask why does it need to be solved? You need to know the why. What is the value of what you're doing? You need to know what the solution needs to have. And are there any constraints? So I, before I do any of this, I want to make sure I have those three answers. Now, it's important that we have these answers because they form our compass or our bearing in terms of how we proceed with making the decision about this uh, process, how we're gonna go about solving the solution for this. And we also wanna make sure that our answers here are honest, accurate, and complete. Sometimes we might not wanna be either dig deep enough to answer one of these questions, or we maybe don't wanna be honest about the answers. But if you really wanna make the best decision possible, then you really want them to be honest, accurate, and complete. Step number two, identify your options. Seems pretty obvious. Uh, start off with a list of potential approaches. It could be the ones that are really clear in your mind. It might be something that uh, is far out or kind of unconventional. That's all fine. Depending on how large of the uh, problem is or how monumental it is, you'll probably you'll want to have more options to work with. If you don't have enough options, if you're not happy with the options that come to mind, there's a number of ways you can get more. Research such as Googling or looking on Stack Overflow or other sources in books can provide some, some different approaches that you might not have thought of. Uh, networking, social media, talking to your peers is another way to get some potential uh, approaches. And then brainstorming. Though I won't get into any brainstorming techniques today, there are lots of really good ones that can help you and a group come up with ideas that may not have been really obvious to you. Uh, you can do nothing, uh, but one thing I would say about this is make sure you collect them all before you proceed, and uh, uh, don't uh, eliminate any of them yet, because that's not part of this step. Step three, qualify your options. So we're gonna go three, through each of the options, and we wanna answer the following questions. We're collecting data on them at this point. What's the likelihood that this option is gonna meet our goals? We need to know. Uh, what are the risks involved with this particular option? And what's the time, effort, and cost? You want to collect these equally for all of them. Don't skip over any of them. You need to fill out your matrix of data knowing how all of your options compare to each other 
this way. Step four, choose the best option, right? The profit, something like that. Uh, <clears throat> so before we choose the best option, we do need to get one more piece of information. We need to determine the important factors for making our decision. It could be time, it could be cost, it could be process, it could be people-based. There's lots of different angles, uh, depending on your problem, that are going to be important for uh, providing uh, the best way of weighing your options. So once you know your important factors, you can then sift through them. I do recommend that you cut down the number of your options uh, in case there are, if you have like eight or 10 or 15, that's a lot to go through. I like to eliminate it down to maybe the, like five or three, and then you can really look closely at them. At that point, then, you, then hopefully one stands out. If one doesn't stand out, there's a couple things you can do. First of all, you can involve others or expand your circle with from whoever was involved in this process to get some feedback from them. But you can also um, just go with the best one. You don't need to be paralyzed by trying to make the perfect choice. Sometimes you just, it needs to be a good enough choice and you move on. You've already done so much work at this point that uh, you're going to be uh, uh, well better off than you had if you just guessed at the beginning. The fifth, the fifth step is reflection. And this is one that lots of um, organizations do not do. They, they may have done these four steps uh, informally up to this point, but they might not do this step. And this is actually really crucial. You want, this is your retrospective, essentially. Once you've gone far enough into your uh, solution and gotten some results, how did it turn out? What's your lessons were learned from it? Are there ways to improve your process? This is such a critical part because this is how you can maximize learning. As a matter of fact, it is sort of your secret sauce. So, some things to keep in mind. The bigger the issue, the more thorough you should be. If it's a really, really small issue, you might rush through all of these in the course of five minutes. It can be that simple. It doesn't have to be you know, a week-long process, but if it's a really big issue, it might be multiple weeks or longer, depending on if it's a multi-organization type deal. Uh, consider their overall value when investing your time and effort. If it's not a big deal, if it's not that important, then you probably shouldn't, unless you're just practicing, spend too much time on it. And be aware of too many choices that can really uh, slow you down. Trick number three, know your context. You probably have heard folks answer questions. It depends, right? Well, that's context playing out, uh, but it is important. So in our industry, here's a few contexts that you can consider. And if you're starting out, if you're newer to this, these are things that I recommend you definitely know. For example, know your tech stack and its alternatives. What are the implementation details and gotchas that you might go through as you try to do something in one stack or another? You should know this. It'll help you make your decisions. Know your stakeholders. You know what is important to them. What do they value? How risk adverse are they? You know what's the cost of a mistake in their eyes? Depending on what your stakeholder, how they view things, that's going to affect how the kind of decisions you're going to make. You know your teammates. You know what are their skills? You know are there politics involved? Are there things that you shouldn't be doing? Uh, you want to know and be sensitive to your teammates so that when you are faced with decisions, you can decide and factor in their input or how they are when you're doing that. And finally, your product's business and market. This is one that I see so many developers, they don't really know this, and I'm a little confounded by this. Like, this is so important because we, especially when we're down building how a feature works and how it plays out, that we can take a lot from knowing how the business really needs to work and how the market works because we can make a better decision about how to implement something or, or maybe raise a red flag when something the stakeholders were mis you know, didn't understand. All of a sudden, you can see it more clearly. You can communicate that back up. So all these, knowing these contexts can help you give, it can give you important insight that you can then make better decisions. Trick number four, keep a dev journal. Oh, some of you might be going, oh, really? <laughs> Seriously. Well, yes. Actually, for my purposes, this is something that um, I have them all do, and they um, have gotten some really, really good results. If you're pretty experienced, perhaps you may feel like you don't need to do this, but even one of my most experienced team members does still keep a dev journal and is really uh, very valuable to him. So the way it works, um, or at least the way that I sort of instruct on it is I start off with a very uh, task-centric journaling. So we have a pre-task entry 
And these are these are the four sort of questions or areas that I want them to jot down before they get started on something. You know, what is your understanding of this task? Are there any questions or uncertainties? What represents doneness? And then map out your approach or how you think you're going to solve the problem. The important piece here is that I'm having them exercise a mental model of what is needed to accomplish the task. And I don't want them just diving into code. I want them to think about it. And it will probably be a little rough for them in the beginning. It always is. But it's very illuminating for them as they go through it. The post-task entry. So once they've gotten started and they're wrapping up, I want them to enter these things as they go along. What did they learn? What did they get stuck on? Any sort of feedback was given, like in a PR or during when they're pairing or when they're talking to their fellow teammates. I want them to record that. This is important so when they look back, they can think about how it went. This is about immediate reflection on what they're doing and tracking their progress. So this is really important. It's helpful when they look back on things. I do want them to use it daily, and I want them to be pretty rigorous about their notes. It could be anything work-related. It doesn't have to be just tasks. We start off with that because that's very easy. I can, I can verify and say, okay, show me your notes. How did it go? Okay, great. Why didn't you take your notes? Um, you do want to use your app daily, um, and you want to stop at the end of the day and reflect. And this is about creating a habit of paying attention and reflection daily. And if you develop this, whether you write it down or not, you will be getting this feedback as you go along daily to get better. Trick number five, estimate. And yes, I do have them estimate when they're starting off. A little rough. That's the point. So estimation. So with estimation, I start off with a process like this. And it's pretty basic. Write down the task in smaller parts. And how small the part needs to be is until they can imagine pretty much everything that happens in that part. So much so that they can now record time, their estimate of what they think. And I usually tell them to keep it at a a half day, day, multiple day, week kind of level at first. If they want to do hours, that's fine. All I care about is they're thinking about it, that they are putting some sort of estimate there, some sort of number that they're going to pay attention to. Then they have to track their time. Now, I don't do this for the business. I don't turn these numbers over to project management or anything like that, because that's not the point here. This is not why I'm having them do this. This is about their mental model and understanding what their perception of what it takes and what it actually takes, how that varies. So in step four, we compare actual time with estimated time. And usually it's not good. <laughs> um, step five, reflect on why they were different. That's actually really the most interesting piece. Why are they different? Are you just not good at estimation? Or are you just not you're missing something? Is there some piece of complexity that's not there yet? That's really the interesting conversation that happens when they're doing this. So that is trick number five. Trick number six, intentional practice. So I want them to be deliberate. This is them working towards something. I want them to work towards a goal, pick something they can work on, and sort of improve their skills. I want them to do this on their own. So pairing doesn't count. This does not count for this sort of practice. Um, I also want them to practice as they wish to perform. That's kind of an odd thing to say. It comes from my musician days. But if you're practicing and you're making mistakes or you're not being mindful, then that is going to be learned by your, your mind and your muscles. And that's how you're going to perform later on. So when you're practicing, I want them to strive for sort of like their best. This is like a code, um, code retreat type exercise where they are. It's not realistic. You know, it's not like you're shipping production coding. You're just working on something to learn. And you should be evaluating your process. Trick number seven, fail. So I, um, unknowns to my apprentices, I always give them at least one or two tasks that I know they're not going to succeed at. I purposely give them something they can't handle. You could say I want them to have a camera moment. <laughs> I want them to hit the wall. What happens when you don't know what to do, when you don't have the answers? 
you learn a lot about someone or yourself in those situations. And I want this to happen because it's going to happen one way or another, and I like to have it in a little controlled environment. So we can call this fail like Goldilocks. So the piece here, the, it's, I guess the key is here to remember, is that I, I want you to go beyond your comfort zone. I want you to try something that you probably won't succeed at. You might succeed, or you might only partially succeed, or you might just completely fail. That's OK. I do want to be in a safe place, so yeah, not in production. Um, but there's a, there is a point if you go too far. You want to avoid being overwhelmed and confused. If you go too far, then your mind shuts down and you realize, I can't do anything right. I'm just completely, this is, I should just quit. Why am I even here? I don't want to go that far, but I want to get to that place where they're like, whoa, I'm, I'm not sure and I'm, I'm flailing here. And this is about learning from your mistakes. And you'll learn that actually this is fairly normal. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but I've certainly been in this place lots and lots of times. And knowing how to be in that space and how to adapt is so critical to what we do. So, trick number seven. Trick number eight, seek feedback. So feedback is a critical part of what we do. We do it at so many levels. I mean, you can think of uh, you're in the editor, and you, uh, if you're compiling or if you're writing, executing your code, does it work? That's a form of feedback. You know, what's your test suite telling you? you know, how does, what is the build? Or as you get it out deployed, what does QA tell you? What does your stakeholders tell you? Your client review, your users? These are all different levels of feedback. And um, getting feedback from your coworkers on how you are doing is just important. Sometimes it's not offered, and if it's not, you should seek it out. Now, you might not be very comfortable with this. It might be, um, it might be hard to go and ask for feedback, but you should push through that and do it anyway. The, uh, it's pretty rare that people will give you that feedback, and usually they'll be doing it for your own good. They're giving you um, good feedback so you can grow. So part of this is learning to receive feedback gracefully. There are a few things I want to mention about this. Listen carefully. This includes paying attention to body language, tone of voice, emotions. You may not be very good at that, but you should start to try to listen carefully. Listen empathetically. Consider the speaker's reasons for offering feedback and assume the best intentions. If you're stating feedback in your own words, this is where you repeat back what you hear. So the speaker, the person offering you the feedback, can hear it as well. They may realize that how you heard that feedback is not how they intended, and they can clarify. So that's important as well. And then notice how you're feeling. If you become angry or defensive about the feedback you're getting, that's going to cloud your ability to listen effectively and take it in. If, it's, if that's reality, if that's how things are, then you know, there's no point in denying it. Know that feedback is a gift, except that we are always learning, and that uh, you cannot improve your skills if you aren't receptive. Making better decisions comes from our practice of being mindful as we intentionally improve our skills. That's what it comes down to. With my apprentices and the way I look at this, my ultimate goal is this. Can you be independent? Can you be consistent? trusted. And that is the basis of making good decisions. I know you can do it when I can answer yes to all those questions. You may not get it right. It's not about being perfect, because we aren't. But it is about us using, um, growing and using our resources as wisely as possible. Thank you.